two, three, four. Good morning, Hope Church. It's a beautiful day to worship our King. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together this morning as we sing praise.
we praise you today for who you are, Lord. And we just thank you so much for loving us and bringing us together as a family. Father, as we gather here this morning as believers, as we stand here as your children, we open our hearts and we lay them before you at your feet. God, move among us, work in our lives and in our hearts to glorify you, to focus on the things that are most important and to give you glory in everything we do. No matter what we are facing this day, no matter what this week has brought to our lives, God, we know that you are bigger and you are greater than every worry and every fear and every trial that we face. So in this moment, we surrender to you. We give you our whole lives in, as an offering, and we worship you with our hearts, with our lives, and our minds. And we sing, we raise our voices, we lift our hands in uninhibited worship. We worship how you shaped us to worship, and we give you praise.
worship Jesus. As we worship this morning and we gather together, we worship in song, we worship in fellowship, we're going to worship by hearing the word and a teaching. And in this moment right now, we worship by taking communion as a family. We commune together and we reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus, the greatest display of love the world has ever seen. And in communion, we commune as a family and we commune as individual children with our creator. If you did not receive communion on the way in, just go ahead and raise your hand and an usher will bring you everything you need. The belief in your heart that Jesus Christ gave his life for you, that he conquered death and he rose from the grave and you will spend eternity with him in heaven is the only permission that you need to participate in communion in this family. We are an imperfect group of believers. And we worship how God designed each of us uniquely to worship. He made each of us different for a reason. So as a family, we remember and we reflect on the body and the blood of our Savior. I encourage you to participate in communion however you feel comfortable, how God shaped you for worship at any time during this next song. As we remember together our brother and our friend, our Savior and our King, Jesus.
Hey, Hope Church, are you glad to be here today? Hey, Amen. Good to see you. David in the Bible said, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. It's not a funeral. It's a time to celebrate and worship. We have tables out today. You may have noticed that. And uh, we don't do that every week, but we have a meal afterwards. Everyone's invited. Don't worry about if you didn't bring something, you're here and you're welcome to stick around following our service and enjoy that meal. We also hand out a thing we call a bulletin that you may have got coming in. Inside that, you'll find a little con uh, connections card where you can write any prayer request. Also, in the, on the online church, you can put in there, if you have a prayer request, love to hear your name, where you're from, being a part of our online church. And also, I would say to any new folks, I'm not a stalking pastor. Uh, I won't hunt you down, but I'm not a pushy type. But if you want to ask any questions about hope, put in there. I'd like to have a meeting with the pastor, and I'd be honored to sit down and meet with you and talk about that. And now before we go any further, I want to welcome everyone in person, online, one church. I want to say one thing before we greet one another. Wayne and Jan Cavalli are in the house. <laughs> Wayne and Jan. Wayne and Jan landed in Washington after the fire, and we've missed them dearly. They've been a part of our online presence, and they've, they've been through a lot, and they made it back. They're pioneers. They got a place in paradise, so we're glad to have you back. Let's take a moment. Let's take a quick moment and greet those around you. Tell them you're glad they're here. That's enough. We don't want to overdo this friendly stuff. And if you're an introvert and we scare the heck out of you, I'm so sorry. But we want to be a welcoming place. I love that I can't hush you all up once I let you loose. We're in a series on the book of Acts. Acts is a history book fifth book in the New Testament. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then the book of Acts tells about the begin, beginning and the spread of the church, the early church. And so you can go to Acts 4 if you have a Bible or a device, an app you want to look at for the message. Once I was preparing to teach about Acts, and I've already said to you, a mentor taught me years ago that acts is a call to action. We want to be, what is it? Be what we read. Be what we read. We want to be what? Be what we read. So you read the book of Acts because it's the people we're a part of. It's our history if we're, if we're Christ followers. And God gave us this book. Who wrote it? Luke. Luke wrote it. God guided Luke to write it. And you have the Gospel of Luke and then Acts. So it's like Luke Acts, two volumes. And uh, he writes things that he says certainly took place. And he took great detail to tell the story of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke and the early church in Acts. So I'm, I have that attitude and I'm getting ready to go teach at a church. And I, I took some time that week just reading through the, uh, the book of Acts. And I wrote down things that I saw reoccurring in the lifestyle. I had a yellow pad, and I wrote down things that I saw happening over and over in that early church. I wanted to see the spirit of that church. I wanted to see what they were about, what the lifestyle is about. 
And I'm only going to share two chapters, but it's something that happens over and over. These two chapters we're going to look at changed my life, changed my ministry, changed my job several times, changed the town I lived in. Because frankly, some people don't want to be about the mission or be willing to change. I, while I'm mentioning changes, they changed me and I still have to change if I want to be effective in the mission. And uh, so the thing that we're going to see today, the three things, one is preaching. And when I say preaching, that doesn't mean you have to stand up and yell like me and get all noisy. It'd be so obnoxious if you were all like me, you know. But preaching includes teaching, sharing, uh, pointing toward Jesus, sharing. Uh, so you see this constantly through the book of Acts. Then you see persecution. Paul would later write Timothy that everyone who desires to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He doesn't say might be, could be, everyone. And it doesn't always come in the form of physical uh, punishment like it does tragically still this day. Some places in the world, there's physical persecution. There's also mental, there's verbiage, there's sometimes hurting things that happen. You may have family that are mad at you right now or they don't understand why you're so into God or this church thing. And it hurts kind of because you want them to be excited about it too. And it, that's a tough thing because you love them and you believe in God and following Christ and it's changed your life for good. It's healthy, it's positive, it's meaningful. But sometimes we go through difficulty as followers. So you got preaching, persecution, and the other one is prayer. Prayer. They're continuing in prayer, and we're going to see that in chapters 4 and 5 today. We ended in chapter 4 last week where Peter and John had done a miracle. They healed someone in the name of Jesus, a guy who'd been lame from birth, and they would, people would lay him by a gate called Beautiful at the temple, and he would beg to survive. And Peter and John stopped, said, silver and gold have I none, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise and walk. And they healed him. So they did a miracle. And if you can imagine, people are blown away. That guy's jumping up and down. He's so excited. And uh, um, what does Peter do when he sees a crowd gather, folks? What does, he, what does he do? What does he talk about? What, what's the gospel about? Jesus. It's a person. Gospel means good news, right? The gospel's not bad news. I'm sorry, sometimes we've made it sound like bad news, perhaps, but it's good news. The good news of Jesus. God came down and Christ died for our sins. You don't have to beat yourself up all the time for your sins. He paid the price for your sins, past, present, future. As you live in faith, you're free of that. And it's good news. And their, their heart of their message is the resurrection. He died on the cross for our sins. We crucified the Savior of the world. So over and over, when Peter gets a crowd, that's like saying, sick him to a bulldog. Here we go. He's going to talk about Jesus. And he does that in chapter 4. Some Jewish leaders show up, greatly disturbed, Luke writes, because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus, there it is, the resurrection of the dead. Proclaiming, teaching, preaching, they're greatly disturbed. The religious leaders couldn't get past the fact that Jesus didn't fit what they thought the Messiah would be like. And so they got angry when people taught about Jesus, just like there's people in this world who will get mad at you if you share your love for Jesus. They're greatly disturbed. And so they seized Peter and John, and because it was at night, they put him in jail so they could do the court the next day and meet in a session to question them, persecution. Preaching, persecution. And so they put him in jail, and, uh, but it says in verse 4, but many who heard, say heard. heard. Many who heard the message believed. You can't believe unless you hear. People can't hear unless we tell it. Paul wrote about that. And sometimes we send others, he talked about. Blessed are the feet of those, beautiful are the feet of those that spread uh, good tidings to others. And so uh, many who heard believed, even though they're under persecution, the church continues to grow. They're brought in before what's called the Sanhedrin. That's the Jewish 
ruling council. Sometimes you read and you'll see Pharisees or Sadducees or lawyers, and you, you have the experts of the law, the elders of Israel. You have these, these leaders of their community. They're brought before them. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, they, they asked this question, brought before the, the Sanhedrin, by what power or what name did you do this? What's Peter thinking? I'm glad you asked, right? And so he's going to tell them by what power or name that you do this. When you say name, the, the, the ancient mind thought about authority and who someone was by the name. Uh, it was character, but it's who Jesus is by his name. And so he says, if we are, are being called to account today for an act of kindness, Shown to a man, that's what's tragic. They're doing good and helping people, and they're being persecuted. A man who was lame and are asked how he was healed, then know this. Now he's going to get right to it. Know this. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. He just preached the gospel. That this man stands before you healed. Peter says, Jesus is the way. There's no other name given. You see, we get so afraid because we think we got it. You don't got to know all about Leviticus and Exodus. It's good to learn those things. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I really highly encourage Bible reading. But you don't have to know everything. You need to know a person to share. They knew a person who changed their life. Now, it says in verse 13, when they, the Sanhedrin, saw the courage, or your translation may say boldness, of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled. They hadn't gone to the, the seminary or the cemetery. No, seminary. They hadn't uh, gone and walked as a Jewish culture did with a Jewish rabbi. They'd grow up and only the cream of the crop would be picked to walk with a rabbi. And they would learn to teach and become like their rabbi. They hadn't been in formal training. And then it says, unschooled, ordinary men. Ordinary men. They were astonished. They saw this boldness in them, even though they're ordinary and they're unschooled, and they're astonished. They're blown away. And this, if you're a note taker on the bulletin notes, ordinary people doing the extraordinary is what we see in the book of Acts over and over. In fact, the whole Bible, God loves to do it. He takes ordinary people like you and me and does extraordinary things. He shows up in a, a small, remote place and says to a, a, a young girl, Mary, she's going to have the Savior of the world. And her, her attitude is awesome. I, maybe, as you said, I'm, I'm your servant. But he's born to peasant parents in a small, remote place. And God does his work through imperfect people throughout history. If you're ordinary, join the club. And the path to boldness is stated in the next sta statement. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. These ordinary men who had this extraordinary boldness had been with Jesus. And I used to say all the time from that verse, if you spend time with Jesus, it will give you courage and it'll make you bold. And I still believe that, but I learned a new thing studying for this this week, a new thought. I hadn't thought about it, this verse. When you look at them being with Jesus before the cross, they weren't bold. They weren't courageous. They deserted him at the cross. It was after the resurrection they became bold. It was after the ascension, when he ascended to heaven, he said, go make disciples and I'll be with you always. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit to help you. And he ascends and they became bold. When Pentecost came, the, the Jewish festival, and the Holy Spirit showed up like Jesus said, and the church exploded, they were bold. They were courageous. And God makes ordinary men and women like you and me bold and courageous when we spend time with Jesus, the resurrected Jesus. So you got preaching. It's happening again. And uh, it says, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could see, they could say. See, they hated this, but they've got this guy, this 
elephant in the room standing there that's kind of hurting what they want to accomplish because everybody sees the miracle, the layman standing there. And tragically, sometimes people see miracles and still don't want to believe or follow. Like the blind man in the Gospel of John, his parents were more afraid of being thrown out of the synagogue than uh, admitting the miracle that their son was healed. A beautiful thing happened because of Jesus, but they were more afraid of being kicked out of their church, their tradition. So these leaders here in Acts have a business meeting. What are we going to do with these men? They asked everyone, you know, they asked each other, and they're trying to figure it out, and they're like, everyone in Jerusalem knows. But to stop this thing from spreading among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Say the name. The name. We must warn them not to speak in the name. It means in who Jesus is, who Jesus' authority is. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach. They commanded them. Now think about this. This is, if you're raised with leaders in your community and your faith and you go to the synagogue and you're raised by parents to follow these leaders and they're commanding them and you've seen something amazing that you're supposed to share that Jesus said be witnesses and all of your your city leaders are commanding you not to and Peter and John replied which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him you be the judge You know, the Bible tells us to obey the governing authorities. Christians are taught a way of submission, not forced, but willful submission to serve, to love. But the time that stops is when humans try to tell us something against God. We must obey God rather than men. Live for an audience of one. If you follow the the crowd, you get lost in the crowd. Acts 4.20 then, they say, but we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. We cannot not. This is what you call in grammar a double negative. We cannot not. NIV says we cannot help speaking. The the New Living says we cannot stop telling. Berean Study Bible says we cannot stop speaking. Berean Literal Bible says we are not able to stop. We cannot not. Now, double negatives is when you use the word like no or not or can't twice in a sentence and trying to make a positive statement. It's frowned upon in English to use a double negative. It's considered poor grammar and confusing. Like if I say no one was not suffering, you're going to go, huh? Uh, Oh, you're saying everyone was suffering. Yeah, no one was not suffering. Or I haven't had no emails. I haven't had no emails. You mean you, you haven't had some emails? It's confusing. Or my, my favorite, I can't get no satisfaction. <laughs> He's saying I can't get satisfied, right? I can't get no satisfaction. Now your minds are going, I try and I try. <laughs> I've lost my crowd. Ancient Greek, however, used double negatives in their writing. And so Peter says, we cannot not because of what we've seen or heard. You don't find, this is something interesting, I think, if you think about it. You don't find in the epistles, the epistles are not the wives of the apostles. The epistles are letters. Uh, Paul started churches in Acts, and then he writes them these epistles. That's why you have Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, Corinthians, Thessalonians, etc. And you don't find him all the time saying, you need to evangelize more. You need to talk more about Jesus. You need to spread the word more. You know why? Disciples just did it. They just did it. That was their mission. A lot of times, brand new baby Christians, they're fired up, boy. They just found the good news. They've been saved. They got a relationship with God. And some of the older Christians are like, oh, you'll calm down. You'll calm down. Settle down a little bit. You see, they didn't have to tell them over and over to evangelize because that's what disciples do. But you, you do find some verses with this same kind of thought where they can't help it. When God gets a hold of you, you can't help it. Jeremiah 20, verse 9. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak anymore in his name, his word is in my heart 
like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I can't. I cannot hold it in. It's a fire in my bones. Another prophet, Amos 3, verse 8. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who will not prophesy? 1 Corinthians 9, 16, the apostle Paul, a persecutor. We're going to study his life in this series. He, he became a believer. He says, for when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast. It's not bragging on myself about it. Because he says, since I am compelled to preach, I'm compelled. Woe to me, he says, if I do not preach the gospel. When God gets a hold of you, when God changes our life, we feel compelled to tell the beautiful story. 1 John 1, verse 1 one of the early apostles that walked with him, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have touched, that we proclaim concerning the word capitalized of life. He's talking about Jesus. Word is personified. He's the word. And he says, we proclaim that. And then in the same chapter, 1 John 1, 3 and 4, he says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that. Everybody say, so that. So that. So that. There's a reason we proclaim what we've seen and heard. So that you may also have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Oh, there's no greater joy than when someone becomes a part of the fellowship. That's why I'm so excited to see Wayne and Jan back here, a part of the fellowship. There's no greater joy when uh, also a new person comes to the Lord, right? A new baby in a family changes the whole family, you know? Parents don't go, ho oh, hum, yeah, we had a kid today. You know, it's just another day. And so... After further threats, it says in verse 21 of Acts 4, they let them go. They threatened them. It says. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Dr. Luke is very detailed. This is a miracle. Even though persecuted for preaching. And they preach and they're persecuted. The church continues to make an impact. And Peter and John are released to the church, and they go back to their brothers and sisters in the church. And verse 24 says, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in what? Prayer. Preaching, persecution, prayer. And they begin their prayer. I'm just going to read a few sections out of that. I want you to hear their heart in this prayer. It's so good. Sovereign Lord. I love that. Sovereign Lord. You find Jeremiah, ah, oh, Sovereign Lord going through hard times it's good when you remember who's really ruling he's sovereign he's ruling he's reigning he's over all oh sovereign lord they said you made the heavens and the earth and the sea everything in them they're under fire of persecution and they're praying and they start off by remembering who god is god rules God is greater than our difficulties. God is in charge. These people who are persecuting think they're in charge, but they're not. God is. And then they say this. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Who's David? King David. King David. Yeah, the shepherd, uh, giant killer, became a king. His tribe is what? What tribe is he from? If you're new, don't let me scare you to death. You don't, it's not a test. You don't have to know. But it, yeah, it's Judah. And it was prophesied that the Messiah would come through the, through the tribe of Judah. David was even told this. And David's son was Solomon. And, and he did great things. So what book did he write, did David write? Psalms. That big book in the middle of, you open the middle of your Bible, there's Psalm. A great book to read, to teach you a devotional heart, to praise God. Proverbs by Solomon's a good book to read. There's one for every day. You can read that every day for wisdom and making good decisions. You can read Psalms for getting a heart of praise. But you know what else? A heart of when you're ticked off at God. Sometimes David in a lot of the Psalms is angry with God. You see, God's got broad shoulders. 
We learn from David, God can handle it. And David's got a, he's a man after God's own heart. So they call him our father, David, because that's an ancestor. And they say, they're saying in this prayer, hang in here with me, because I want you to hear this. It's pretty encouraging when you get it. He, he's, he, they're saying this prayer from the words of David, where they say, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Now, you and I, we're Gentiles probably, maybe a Jew here or there, but we're mostly Gentiles. We would hear that the first time and go, yeah, that's cool, David wrote it. But, but if your teeth on the prophets, if you grew up hearing these scriptures, you know when, he's, when they're, what they're quoting they're quoting something for a reason from the Psalms that were written hundreds of years before. Sometimes it's good to pray God's word to God. Did you know that? You have that example right here in other places. Like I'll say, God, you say, cast all your anxiety on you because you care about me. And I'm claiming that promise because I really want to worry right now because I can't figure out how to get out of this mess, God. But you say you care about me. I'm going to claim that. Please take this word. That's praying the word of God. That's what they're doing here. They're praying the words of the Psalms. Now listen to it. You have, if you're a Bible reader, you have a little footnote on that verse 26. And it says Psalm 2, 1 and 2. It's saying what they're saying in their prayer in the New Testament goes back to that Psalm. Listen to this. Why do the nations conspire or rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed. His anointed is Messiah. They anointed kings and priests. Christ means the anointed one. Messiah means the anointed one. He was appointed to be the rescuer, the savior. They're saying what David wrote about is happening right now. Now, here's verse 4. They don't quote in Acts 4, but I know they're thinking about it. Verse 4. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. You know what a scoff is? Ha! Let's all do a scoff. Ha! Hey, listen to that. You know a scoff. Yeah. Ha! God, God who reigns, see these people trying to rage against his people and against his son, the Messiah who he sent. And he's like, ha! Because God is in charge. And then they say, back to Acts 4, the prayer, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, that's the Roman governor who, who granted Jesus to be crucified, met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They're saying what David said hundreds of years before that was talking about Jesus, and it's happening right now. And you, the people they're talking to, are being carrying this out, but you don't know that God's really in charge and God's purpose will be done. So now, I'm going to get up in your business a little bit, okay? I'm going to get up in my business. How about a little application? Whatever pressure you're under today, you remember who God is, your sovereign Father. And he's got this. God's got this. Difficult circumstances, fire, trauma, pandemic, sickness, sickness of loved ones, having a hard time under pressure, worried about your kids or your grandkids, trying to make a living, financial struggles, struggles in your family, pressure from the world who doesn't believe in the name. You remember who's got this, raging against the Lord's anointed one, the one in heaven who reigns, scoffs. Ha! Ha! Look at these people trying to stop my son and stop my mission and stop my church. Ha! I've got this. So after preaching, after persecution, they pray and they say this in their prayer after just being reminded who God is, sovereign Lord, who's really in charge, now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to hide. Oh, wait, no, I didn't say that. Enable your servants to get, quit being so fired up and excited about the name of Jesus, to go with the flow, to, to tame it down a bit. No, 
Enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. And the ground shook. An earthquake, earthquake happened. And they prayed. They spoke the word with boldness. God answered their prayer. Paul wrote the church in Colossians saying, devote yourselves to prayer. We saw that in Donald's message, the third week fellowship, Acts 2, 42. They were devoted to four things. The apostles' teaching, that's what we're studying right now. Breaking of bread, we did that with communion. We're going to have a fellowship meal afterwards. The fellowship, the community of faith, and to prayer. They're devoted to prayer. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. Then he says, and pray for us too. This is Paul who's planting churches all over the Roman Empire. And he says, I need your prayer, that God would open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. I forget sometimes that I need help until, until a famine happens in my, my mission. I can't find anybody to share. I'm not finding any opportunities. I always say it's feast or famine. I start praying about it, and God provides me an opportunity to talk to someone. And so Paul says, uh, pray that I'll be wise. And he says to them that I may prepare... Proclaim it clearly. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace. Season with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. Not so you can win every argument. Not so you can beat people up. Because you want to lead people to our loving God. Oh, you're into religion. I tried religion. Oh, no, seasoned with salt. I'm not into religion. I'm into a relationship with the creator of the universe. That's awesome. Religion is boring and oppressing, and I can't do good enough. Oh, hypocrites go to church. Well, that's a dumb thing to say. No, don't say that. Seasoned with salt. Hypocrites go to church. Well, you know, actually, that's the best place for them. The church is for sinners. Hypocrites go to the gas station, too. Are you going to quit going there? Hypocrites go to the grocery store. Are you going to quit going there? Season with salt. Christians are so judgmental. I'm sorry. Yeah, I own it. I own it. I, I, I'm part of that fellowship, and I'm not leaving until they put me in the ground. And I'm thankful for the church. But I, because I'm part of it, I'm part of the problem if we're too judgmental. So I have no problem saying I'm sorry if you've had a bad church experience. There are human beings in the church, and human beings make mistakes. Churches will let you down. Pastors will let you down. Jesus will never let you down. The way is a person. And so after they, they prayed, the place is shaken. They speak the word with boldness. And after that, Luke mentions at the end of the chapter that amazing fellowship that we studied a couple of weeks ago. All the believers were one in heart and mind and shared with anyone in need. There's great generosity. In Acts chapter 5, I need to go quickly so I can uh, get you ready to eat or whatever you got to do. The apostles are helping people. They're preaching the message, but they're helping people in need. The church is growing massively. And it says the religious leaders are full of jealousy and have the apostles arrested and thrown in jail again. Religious leaders jealous? They don't do Religious people don't get jealous, do they? Well, I heard that church down the road's doing real good. I don't know about that, you know. You know what? When one church do, does good, we all do good. And God made them all different for a reason because different kinds of churches reach all kinds of people and we want them all to do good. We're all one body. And jealousy is what put Jesus on the cross and jealousy here puts the apostles in jail, persecution. They were preaching and now there's persecution. But at night, an angel of the Lord pierce, <laughs> opens the door and tells them to get out. And you know what he tells them to do? Go hide! Man, you need to tame it down a little bit. Quit talking about that. You're going to get in trouble. The Spirit of God tells them to go back to the temple courts and tell the people about this new life. That's the Spirit of God. Don't shut up. Don't back down, back away. Tell it. Tell the good news. 
And so it's like a movie, you know, because movies flash back and forth to different scenes of people happening at the same time. Meanwhile, the Sanhedrin gathers in the morning. All right, it's time to bring those guys in. We're going to have this meeting, and we're going to get serious with these guys. And so they send someone to go get them. They come back. Well, the door's locked, and the guards are there, but there's nobody in the, the jail. Can't you see their eyes rolling? Then somebody runs in. The people that were in jail are back at the temple courts preaching to the people. Don't you see their eyes rolling? Oh, brother, what are we going to do with these guys, right? And so they bring them in, and they said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Say name. 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 Yet you have filled Jerusalem, they filled their city, with your teaching and determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. We're all guilty. Why? We're sinners and he died for all of our sins. And he doesn't want us to live in guilt. He wants to set us free, but he wants us to want him to accept that, that and believe in him and what he did. So Peter and the other apostles replied, what do you think Peter's going to talk about? <laughs> Jesus. We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus. He's in his second sentence, and he's already a Jesus. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross, and God exalted him to the right hand as prince and saviors. And he, he, he mentions repentance of sins. And he says, we're witnesses, and they can't hear the good news. Tragically, they can't hear the good news. And the apostles, verse 40, were flogged, beaten, whipped, and ordered not to speak anymore. And they left the Sanhedrin. Listen to this. You usually got 39 lashes if it was a whip. And sometimes they beat with rods. And they left rejoicing that they had been counted worthy suffering disgrace for the name. I drove down this hill on fire thinking, wow, I thought of this verse. God, you must have faith in us, letting us go through this. I thought of this verse as we met in a borrowed church facility in Chico for a year, and week by week we said goodbye to people we loved so much and become part of our family. I thought about this verse because this verse says God you not only have faith in God but when God allows you to go through a challenge he has faith in you God believes in you and God has this much faith in us that he lets us go through these things for the name to promote the name of Jesus and day after day this is what they did along with rejoicing in the temple courts and from house to house they never stopped say never stopped they never stopped teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. They couldn't stop. When we were down in Southern California, we met with my cousin Penny, who started uh, Seeds of Hope, which is now called Seeds of Hope International. And I was so excited for Gina and Kim to meet her. And we're a part of her ministry. We have been since they began, really. Well, I, I got a memory today. You get memories in Facebook. It's a letter she wrote in 2014. And she's talking about she'd been home on furlough for a little while. And it'd been nice. Well, now she's back in Costa Rica. Her husband isn't there yet. And she talks about a bat flying in and hitting her uh, the first night. And she throws her laptop. And she says, there's turds all over the house. Turds on my bed. And I lay at night thinking, where are those little turds coming from? What's crawling around in my house? I'm so tired of walking in the yard and there's snakes. We're looking out for snakes. There's snakes in Costa Rica. If you get bit by one, you might as well have a seat somewhere because you're done. And she rock, talks about, then my air, air conditioner went out in my car and I rolled the doors, down, the windows down and the windows won't go back up. And I went in to take a shower and I'm already sweating five minutes out of the shower because it's so hot and so humid. And then my hot water uh, boiler overheated and w was going all over the house and flooding and I got a neighbor to help me and then I took the stuff I used to wipe the flood up to put them in the washer and dryer and found out they're broke and she said I found out how hard it is to live down here and she left her home in San Diego to set girls free to teach them about Jesus to teach them skills for their life and she went through a lot of difficulty but now it's not just Seeds of Hope it's Seeds of Hope International the model they built 
in Costa Rica has gone on to Nicaragua and El Salvador and to Guatemala and India and Africa. God allows his hard workers in the mission to go through persecution, to go through difficulty. That doesn't mean he's done with you. Rick Warren says, if you want to be used by, by God, get ready, because you're going to walk with a limp the rest of your life, because God uses broken people. But you become that testimony as you follow. I got to go somewhere Monday to celebrate the life of Estrella Cabrera. She was a fiery little Filipino lady in my first ministry, and something I didn't expect happened as I sat there at the, the lunch chapter, one by one, these little Filipino guys and women came up to me, and they had gray hair now. It's really weird when your youth ministry has gray hair, <laughs> and they're middle-aged. And he said, Brother Stan, you baptized me. Brother Stan, you baptized me. There's so many great blessings when you stay about the mission. And think about heaven when we get there. There'll be people that come up to you and go, hey, I want to thank you. For what? Well, you were part of Hope Church, and that's where I found Jesus. And now I'm here in heaven. Tell that day, brothers and sisters, let's commit to continue with the message, to preach, to continue through persecution and hard times, to pray, to draw near to God. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. We are sons and daughters because of the name of Jesus, because of who he is. It's a, it's a name above all names. It's a beautiful name, and we praise you for our salvation. Help us to remember the excitement. This message is not about a guilt trip. I need to do more or whatever. It's about realizing how beautiful it is to know Jesus and to be ready to spread the news. And when we go through difficulty, we know you, sovereign Lord. We're so thankful we have you. And we ask you to continue to, to use us to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand and worship God. You were the word at the beginning, one with God, the Lord most high. You hid
our king, Hope. Well, that was awesome. <laughs> what a great song. Thank you, guys. Let's give it up again for Hope Rising. Great, great song. Thank you. Well, next steps, Gina. What do we got? What do our we got going on? Our growth groups are starting next week. Let yes. me hear you get excited yes. about our yes. growth groups. Growth yeah. groups are the heart of what we do here. Stan says that there are things that we can do in circles that we cannot do in rows. Yeah. You know, uh, I just want to say that every time, I've been doing this, I don't know, a long time, since the 80s, every time a new semester starts, I get nervous. I get nervous. I also go through some of the things Donald shared a couple weeks ago. Like, I don't know if I want to go. or Once I go, I'm so glad I did. And at the end, I'm so close. Jeff is a friend of mine. I already knew good things about Jeff because Dasu told me about him. But then he became part of my group last semester. And Jeff and I are friends. We're friends. And that's what happens when you get together and knit, your hearts are knit together, you know. And uh, so I hope you'll try it. Will you do me a favor? Try it for six, five weeks. See what you think. The rest of this series. And uh, you don't have to do it till Jesus comes. Just, just try it out. That's right. Yeah. And we have sign-ups on the table in the back. Okay, in our oh, uh, ministry table, there's a physical sign-up sheet. But we also offer sign-ups online. So you can check in your bulletin. We have flyers back there and anything you need. And if you have any questions, feel free to come ask. I would love to talk to you about growth groups. Amen, amen. What else? Well, I know there's other stuff. Well, I'm sorry. I'm a little a distracted because lot of there's all this food on the back table back there. <laughs> that's and that's a good step. my tummy's kind of growling. That's the next step, yes. <laughs> but what I'm really excited to tell you is I want you to be paying attention <laughs> and keep your eyes peeled because we're going to be introducing our fall campaign, our church-wide campaign that's coming up here in five or six weeks. Uh, and I can't wait to introduce that to you. So make sure uh, you keep coming back yeah. and listening. I promise you, if you get involved in this campaign, you will grow closer to God. And God will show up, in the, and uh, so you'll hear more about that. Amen. Amen. So uh, as I pray for our offering, now it's time to pray for our offering. Yeah. I also want to thank God for the food, and then we'll celebrate our last song while we give at the same time those who are able to worship through giving. And then we'll have a few minutes setting up, and you're welcome to hang out and enjoy the meal and the fellowship. Thank you so much for uh, being here with us. And... Um, let me say a prayer. Father, everything we have is because of you. We got up this morning because of you, and uh, we give you praise. We ask you to continue to make us a force of hope here on the ridge and beyond that brings you glory, and uh, that's our only aim. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, uh, before we celebrate with our last song, what is our purpose? Relationships. Relationships that last forever. How do we do that? Love God, love people. So remember, every day this week in Christ, we always have hope. One, two, three.
glad you joined us today. We hope you have a wonderful week. For those of you joining us online, we look forward to seeing you next week. We want you to know that we love you. Let's eat. Yeah. <laughs>